gotta say Well that's okay cause time can soon Like a dentist pulls out a tooth Dell was one guy with a big dream. Today, we are more than 100,000 people sitting in dozens of locations all over the world. We have evolved from being a leading seller of PCs to being a business catalyst and solutions leading light. While much has changed in that transformation, much has stayed the same. We are and always will be collaborators. Innovators, dreamers, partners. One man has been a part of that journey from the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Michael Dell. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Dell World. We're so pleased that all of you decided to join us. And you know, the whole Dell story started not too far away from here, about 15 blocks away in my dorm room at the University of Texas. That was uh, 28 and a half years ago. And we had this idea about creating value for customers by letting them build their own PCs. And doing it affordably, efficiently, and simply and really removing complexity for customers and delivering exactly what customers wanted. Today, we're a $60 billion company with tens of millions of customers around the world, with hundreds of millions of devices and products sold around the, the world, supporting billions of users around the globe. And standing here today at our second annual Dell World with over 5,000 of our customers and partners, this is an incredibly uh, powerful moment for me. So I want to thank all of you for the incredible journey that's taken us uh, just 15 blocks, but a million miles from where we started. We value the relationships that we have tremendously, and I'm so proud of what you've accomplished with Dell at your side. From the beginning, Dell has been built to power your dreams. Dell was founded on the principle of accountability to you, to help you achieve your goals. 
and our commitment to earning your trust every single day. I know our partnerships are important to you and that's why you're here with us. And I very much appreciate each of you investing the time to learn more about Dell and how we can help you drive your organizations forward. The Solutions Expo is fantastic. I encourage you to get out and see all the great new products and solutions we, we've created. We have fantastic hands-on demonstrations. We have new innovations and ideas. We have a great lineup of keynotes and breakout sessions, so please, while you're here, take advantage of it all. I think you'll find the time very well spent because uh, Dell is a company very much on the move. Over the last several years, innovations in the cloud, in big data, social media and security have changed the model for how technology is being consumed and delivered. And we're working to democratize and simplify these innovations, putting more power in the hands of more people than ever before. I spent a lot of time meeting with customers, speaking with CEOs and CIOs about what they need to be successful. They need power, they need agility, efficiency, increased productivity, better insights, better security, and they need business results in an increasing, increasingly competitive world. For us, that means delivering solutions. It could be migrating your environment to a modern scale-out data center. It could be standing up a private cloud or modernizing applications off of a mainframe or securing all the new devices in a BYOD environment. What is clear is that delivering differentiated value to you requires us to know more about your business and it requires us to go beyond products by integrating software and services. And that is the consistent and disciplined strategy that we've been pursuing now at Dell for about the last four years. Since we launched our transformation to become the industry's leading provider of end-to-end -end solutions. And, and here at Dell World, we're highlighting the breadth of the $10 billion multi-year investment that we've been driving to realize this vision. And just in the last year, we've invested nearly $5 billion building out our solutions portfolio. So let me share a little bit about you know, what we've been doing and how we've been transforming our business. Uh, of course, we start where the company started, with PCs, what we call the client business. And now we recognize that we increasingly live in a multi-device, bring-your-own-device kind of environment. We're also seeing that the virtual client is being adopted at a tremendous pace. And Dell is the global leader in cloud and virtual clients. And that brings flexibility and agility and efficiency while embracing any device. Now that said, we strongly believe that PCs are important. There are about 400 million PCs sold every year. And the install base of PCs is about a billion and a half. Overwhelmingly, PCs are still how business gets done in the world today. And now with Windows 8, we're on the cusp of the next revolution in PC hardware and software, bringing together the laptop and the touchscreen. And as you've seen here at the Expo and across Dell World, we have a full line of really compelling touch-enabled products, from our XPS 10 tablet to the stunning XPS 27 with its, with its uh, quad HD display, 27-inch touch display, and every kind of imaginable product you could think of in between. Our Latitude 10 tablet runs Windows 8, runs Microsoft Office, and it docks to become a fully configured workstation when you're back in the office. And it works securely with all the other Windows products that you already have. Or the XPS 12, a notebook that transforms into a tablet. And also here at Dell World, we're revealing for the very first time a new 18-inch all-in-one, where the screen just pops out, snap it out, take it with you, and you've got a fully portable four and a half pound workstation or entertainment center. You're gonna have to wait a bit to see that, but you'll, you'll think it's very cool. The possibilities are limitless. 
And as adoption accelerates for Windows 8 and for Touch, it's going to give the entire billion and a half install base of, of uh, users a reason to get a new PC. And in the customer conversations that we've been having, the interest in Windows 8 is quite high. Even with commercial customers who would normally wait a few releases to adopt a new version, what we're seeing is there's really an immediate need because CIOs are worried about the ramifications of a BYOD world. With Windows 8 products, uh, with the kinds of solutions that Dell has created, your employees get the incredible experience that they expect while you get the security, manageability, and reliability that your enterprise really requires. So be sure while you're here to check out Jeff Clark's sessions to hear a whole lot more about our end user computing business. Now next we go to the data center. And from the foundation uh, uh, that we're building out in the data center, uh, we really have a fantastic uh, opportunity to help our customers transform. We call this our enterprise solutions business. And I just want to remind everyone that this is not a new area for Dell. We have been in the server business for almost two decades. We just re released our 12th generation PowerEdge server line, the most advanced server line in the marketplace. And it's really the culmination of a tremendous amount of organic investment based on the feedback that we receive from our customers, really inspired by you. More than 7,700 customers gave us direct input and guided the innovations in this new 12th generation PowerEdge series. And apparently, you like the results. Thanks to our customers, Dell is now number one in market share in servers in North America and Asia. So I want to thank you all for that very much. We appreciate it. And we're only 64,000 servers away from being number one in, in, in the world. So if everybody here buys 10 servers, and I think uh, pretty much got it. But, but, you know, Dell has been gaining share in this server market for quite a long time, and competitors have been moving in the opposite direction. And if you look at the trajectory, we're on a path to become number one in servers worldwide within the next few quarters. We complemented that strength in servers with really compelling networking and storage. And as you can see, we've been growing faster than the competition here as well. We have great technology, offer great return on investment to, to uh, our, our customers, whether they're pure play customers using our networking or storage products. But the real int interesting area here are converged solutions. This is really at the core of the market disruption that Dell is driving uh, right now. What we're doing with converged solutions is abstracting the data center to a higher level. You used to have to worry about ports and switches and LUNs and what kind of memory you had and processors and switches and a lot of, lot of detail. Now you can focus on workloads and quality of service and applications, freeing up time and resources to really drive innovation within your organization. Convergence is really the key. And this allows you to deliver efficient, affordable technology solutions that uh, allow you as organizations to, to, to succeed. And you don't have to put all the pieces together yourself. By having IP in all of the categories in the data center, we've been able to rethink the entire ecosystems. And it, you know, if servers and storage and networking are like the peanut butter and jelly and bread uh, of the data center, our active infrastructure is the sandwich. Active in infrastructure is the most intuitive, flexible, and comprehensive converged solution in the marketplace. And true to Dell's history of being open and embracing open standards, our active infrastructure makes it very easy to integrate with existing frameworks making it much less expensive for you to deploy your virtual or cloud infrastructure. Marius Haas is here, and he's going to be speaking about our enterprise business over the next few days. encourage you to join the sessions. Now, this brings us to software. And software really helps secure and manage your environment. 
And over the last few years, we've been putting together a really smart portfolio, providing for a rich foundation and an incredible platform. This is the, an area where the consistency of our vision and strategy and execution is really paying off big time. We have the capabilities to help ease your transition to modern architectures, to provide the backup and recovery and resiliency required in today's regulatory environments. We can also manage your devices, whether they're mobile or thin clients or PCs, help you migrate to new versions of Exchange, SharePoint, Active Directory, and monitor the performance of your key applications and your network. And then we'll secure and manage the whole architecture from the device to the network to the data center to the cloud. Because while you, you might have noticed that we've been actively assembling lots of new technology with a number of acquisitions, behind the scenes, we've been integrating these into powerful and practical solutions. For example, our CIO Power Board integrates software from the entire portfolio of solutions to provide a unified view of your entire environment, including IT services and managed resources. And John Swainson has some amazing technology to show you, and I think you're going to enjoy getting to, to learn about that later on in the sessions. The final piece of the puzzle is Dell Services, and this helps bring everything together for you. And we've really got a strong team in services with almost half the people in Dell, about 47,000 people in our services organization ready to help you in, in, in achieve your objectives. An example of this is in IT security, our security services, where we're the market leader. We see about 32 billion security events every single day. And we're protecting tens of trillions of dollars of assets for the largest banks and financial services firms in the world, anybody who's transacting a lot of commerce, or protecting any intellectual property of value. And simply by virtue of the scale that we have in this area, we know more about what's going on in the world of cybersecurity than anyone. We know what's out there, we know what's coming, and we know what to do about it. Dell Services is also where we bring deep industry expertise in financial services, in healthcare, in education, and in energy. A good example of this is our medical imaging solution, where we securely store and manage more than 5.5 billion medical images. In fact, nine out of the 10 largest healthcare systems use our service today. Another important area is mission critical support. And I've heard from many of you over the last few days how much you value that critical support from Dell. We manage today more than 114 million mission critical devices through 656 locations where we have spare parts and service teams spread out all over the globe providing two hour and four hour service with really unprecedented levels of service and coverage. And we've made strategic investments to enhance our applications and business process outsourcing portfolios so you can partner with a company that really understands your industry and can bring results directly to your business. And of course, Dell Services is fully prepared to help you migrate to the cloud. We provide the backbone for some of the largest cloud service providers in the world, and we're more than happy to help you build out your own, your own cloud environment for customers who want to do that themselves. But we also have infrastructure and cloud services for customers that want us to architect, deploy, and run it for them. We can stand up your private cloud, we can do it quickly and easily, and we can link it to the Dell cloud as an extension of your own environment. And in this, in this way, you enjoy the best of both worlds with a hybrid deployment, uh, seamless, fully secure, and fully compatible. Now today, we're announcing expanded offerings across security, cloud, application modernization, and support. Our focus is helping customers transform based on the disruptive forces that you face 
and helping those br bring advantage to your organization with those. Suresh Vaswani is the president of Dell Services, and he's got a lot to share with you. I think you'll really appreciate him and the services that Dell can offer. Now, as I said, the, the Dell transformation has been consistent and disciplined, but make no mistake, we're moving aggressively. Over the past few years, we've grown our enterprise solutions, software, and services very significantly to the point where it's now more than half of Dell's gross margin. But I think the most powerful proof points are the customers that we serve, like you all here in this room and, and millions of others. One customer who's embraced our approach is Barclays. Barclays is a major global financial services uh, provider, providing everything from personal banking to investment banking, from credit cards to money management. They have 140,000 people all over the world, 170,000 clients in 51 countries. Let's take a moment and hear their story. We are very excited about the Barclays Transform program, and let me tell you why. I am personally elated because after many decades, Barclays is uniquely positioned to power ahead and transform the world of financial services for our clients and for our customers. We look at the new global realities that we face out in the marketplace, and we see discontinuities and disruptions all over the place, and we think these are like great opportunities for a bank like Barclays to just ride the waves of the future. So what are these waves? We see massive uh, adoption of digital, mobile, uh, and social. We see significant move towards hyper-efficiency and effectiveness. So we decided in Barclays to do something quite unique in the banking industry using mobile and digital and social. And so we came up with this product called Pingit, and on the back of it, something called Barclays Mobile Banking. And together, essentially, they do something no other uh, financial services mobile product does. So for example, if I uh, owe you some money, I can just text you the money, essentially, and you'll get it within five seconds in your bank account. We were completely floored and surprised by the uptake by the customers for Pingit and Barclays Mobile Banking in our data centers, we're unable to keep up in terms of agility and cost and performance with this level of traffic. So we made a hard right turn onto the Dell horizontally scaled PowerHC dense computing platforms. It's been a great success and uh, we hope to keep up with customer demand. In this new transform world, uh, we absolutely need to eliminate all inefficiencies and barriers to work for our employees and colleagues. And so we started the deployment of these 170,000 desktops. We have thousands of applications like any other company who's been in existence more than 10 years. And also include in it things like BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, more importantly, we freed up our employees in the technology department and in the operations department to go ahead and really do things they are good at, which is innovating for clients and for customers. The whole area of controls is very big for us. We rely on Dell's compellent product series. This is with Force 10, as well as our 500 terabytes of storage to help us uh, keep in control and keep Barclays safe uh, from cyber threats. Dell has been a great partner for us and to me for many years. And the reason I say that is because they're an end-to-end -end provider from all the way from the desktop to the data center and everything in between. And I look forward to working with the Dell team and with Michael for many years to come. Barclays is, is a big customer, obviously, and we're really pleased that we've been able to help them modernize and meet their objectives. But at Dell, we aren't just about serving the big guys. Our focus is on solutions that can scale up and down from both 
the, the, the largest companies to the smallest companies. So growing uh, organizations, you know, uh, whether they have the scale of a Barclays or, or a new small business, we're giving them access to things like big data analytics. How do you stand up a cloud or in, in, in advanced collaboration and communications without needing to have a data scientist or a big IT staff with hundreds of people uh, to, to kind of keep things running. Tulane University in New Orleans is one of the most highly regarded selective research universities in the United States with about 4,400 employees and 13,500 students. Charlie McMahon is the CIO of Tulane and he's with us here today. We asked Charlie to come on stage and speak a little bit about what we've accomplished together. Charlie. Michael. Charlie, great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Great to be here. Thanks. So in 2009, you, you joined Tulane University and you found uh, an environment that needed some help and like many of our customers, some challenges in the data center. Tell us what you found and a little bit about your goals and what you hope to achieve. Well, sure. And, and, and although I started in 2009, any story about Tulane really has to go back to Katrina. So at, at the time Katrina happened, as the case is with many institutions, we had IT investments that needed to be made, but because of the economic realities associated with, with Katrina, we had to postpone those for, for longer than we would have liked. So I arrived in 2009 and got a clear message from my president that you know, somehow we've got to come in and do more, uh, more with IT. And we were very quick to get to the place where we're not talking about doing more with less, but we're talking about doing the right thing to advance the institution's uh, objectives. As a concrete example, we had a data center that was almost completely full, no floor space left. We were consuming about 90% of the available power. Mm -hmm. uh, we had four different SAN infrastructures that we were supporting for various factions in our campus. So in the vein of doing more, we, we started consolidating and virtualizing servers. We collapsed from four SANs to two. And if you look at our data center today, we, are, we have about half of our floor space freed up. We are running at less than 50% of the available power. We have literally, because of the partnership with Dell, because this philosophy of doing more, we have literally extended the life of our data center for a decade. Real That's success in the existing uh, space footprint that you had? In, in the existing physical footprint, the existing power and cooling envelope, no changes to that infrastructure, just changes to the way we were implementing the technologies used to support the campus. That's let, me, great. Let, let me give you another example. We also were, were faced with a network that had uh, not had material investments for some period of time. The majority of the fiber that we had in the ground was multi-mode fiber, mm -hmm. uh, and as everybody in the audience uh, knows, that's, that presents challenges with the high bandwidth that we need, particularly in a research environment. So with some help from, uh, from our friends at Dell, we re-architected the network uh, from below ground up. We've replaced all the network's uh, equipment. Uh, and, 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 and it's not simply that we've now have a new modern network that has literally two orders of magnitude more bandwidth than we had before, but we've prepared that network for the, the important things to our, our business uh, objectives. For example, we are uh, now, because we have this network, are able to uh, implement a cloud-based SIP solution for our telephony, so all of our old PBXs are gonna be retired. We are starting an experiment in the fall, I mean in the spring, to deliver entertainment content over our IP network. So we anticipate by, by next fall that we can pull the coax out of the dorm rooms hmm. and not be limited to just those students in the res halls in our ability to provide entertainment content. We can put it in the palm of their hand, on their desktop, or if they prefer, on their TV set. Fiber to the dorm room. I bet some kids would like that. 
They, they would like that, but, but I'll tell you, what they really like is wireless to the dorm room. And their expectation is that they will be able to consume uh, educational content and entertainment content through our wireless network. Uh, and it was not possible until we made these additional investments, put this equipment in with the help of, uh, of, of Dell and network engineers. So what are some of the other sol solutions that Dell brought to the table and you know, how were those differentiated from, from others? Well, so let me, let me back up and start the story to answer that a little bit earlier in my history. My, my first material engagement with Dell was around buying some supercomputers. Now this was back in the day when nobody thought of Dell when they thought of supercomputers. So your team uh, sat down with me and we said, you know, if we take some risks together, we can, we can make a, a pretty nice uh, supercomputer. In fact, we, we did that. Our, our first machine with you debuted at number 24 on the top 500 list. It's a real success story. And at that time, Dell was the place that I could go and, and sit down, and Dell could bring all of the different players to the table for us to, to uh, meet an objective. As Dell has changed over the, the years, my relationship with Dell has changed, and now uh, I view Dell as a place not that can simply bring the, the players to the table to solve my problems, but as a place that has the solutions for my problems. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a, an example. We do a lot of, of, of uh, medical research, life-saving mm -hmm. research. We have faculty that do field work in sub-Saharan Africa. Using one of your products, we're able to securely project their data uh, uh, to their devices in the field uh, uh, in, in ways that just were not possible without uh, your technologies. Uh, so that's a, that, that's, I mean, that's a life-saving example of the things that, that we do, things that matter uh, almost real time in the field and be able to connect that researcher back to their data and back to their instruments and back to their colleagues uh, in New Orleans. Well, that's fantastic, Charlie. Thank you so much for doing this and sharing your story with, with the rest of the Dell World audience. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Charlie. You know, I think one of the great advantages that Dell brings to the data center is a very clear point of view. And we don't have mainframes or mini computers or other legacy software platforms that we're trying to protect. Dell is a company that was born in the microprocessor age. We're not protecting the past, we're inventing the future. And all of our solutions have been built around next generation, scale out industry standard architectures. We're all about helping you tra transition to a much more agile, affordable, modern, and powerful solution that'll help drive your organization forward. For the Translational Genomics Research Institute, or TGen, that means helping drive the organization forward. It's really, for them, about unlocking the power of personalized medicine. Neuroblastoma is a pediatric cancer. It's a cancer seen in kids generally less than six years of age, and it's a tumor of the nervous system. To date, we use chemotherapy that attacks the whole body. About 50% of those kids are going to relapse, and when they do relapse, there's no cure. Every neuroblastoma is a little bit different, and what you want to be able to do is use high-performance computing and new areas like genomics to really target the treatment to the patient. TGen is really focused on trying to bring medical advances from the Human Genome Project into medical benefit for patients with series of diseases and disorders. It took us 10 years and almost $3 billion to sequence the first genome. We've worked with Dell for the past five years and in the past two years have increased by 1,500% our ability to sift through that genetic information in a clinical setting to use it for direct patient benefit. The amount of data that's being generated in each of these tests is around 30 terabytes for a patient. What you're asking people to do analytically is basically take something that's like a law library, okay, shredding it, totally shredding it, and then putting it back together. There's so much data coming at them. 
We want to be able to help them bridge this gap and be able to use data most effectively to be able to bring the best kind of treatment for the patient. A patient can't wait two months for a treatment regimen, especially with children with neuroblastoma. The disease grows very quickly. What we're building is a cloud that allows us to be able to store all this data in a shared environment and then have all the scientists be able to access it any way that they want to. It allows us to incorporate this remarkable new technology that really works on the back of computer systems like Dell's. Uh, in order to really make a difference for our patients. We bring a huge amount of expertise in genomics and proteomics and in high performance computing. So we really bring leading edge techniques that really change the way that this genomics research is done. The lessons learned from this type of a project will be exceedingly useful for many of the common cancers that uh, so many of our families and our family members face. This is definitely the future of medicine. It becomes the model for how you do cancer research moving forward. It's really a fundamental game-changing solution that can be applied to multiple different diseases and disorders and we're excited to be partnering with Dell in that effort. TGEN's Chief Operating Officer Tess Burleson is here with us today at Dell World. Tess, would you mind standing and being recognized? Thank you. I want to really take this opportunity to thank you and your team for giving us uh, the opportunity to help you battle pediatric cancer. We're so proud to be your partner and really pleased to see how you've been using the computing power to, to, to very, very good and, and important uses. And uh, for a deeper look at customer perspectives and more examples of solutions that can help you, I really want you to uh, attend a few of the so sessions that Steve Felice is putting on while you're here. So from the largest companies in the world that are thinking about compliance and manageability and a seamless user experience, to a mid-sized university that needs a better way to connect and collaborate, to a cutting edge research institution that's using our computing power and pushing the boundaries of personalized medicine Dell's agile and efficient technology creates opportunities for you. And as the world looks for a sustainable path for greater economic prosperity and job creation, we believe that technology can create tremendous opportunities here as well. Following every downturn, entrepreneurs have emerged to create new businesses that have jumpstart the economy. And Dell can help these companies succeed. I'm very proud to announce today the Dell Center for Entrepreneurs, which creates a gateway to knowledge solutions and opportunities for growing businesses. Founders at all stage of growth companies are invited to join us in this community. We're gonna help with access to capital, with help with expertise, with building on what we've learned through our own journey, and we'll also help bring solutions that enable businesses of all sizes to continue to grow and serve their customers. And finally, we're working with some really exciting partners in this effort, like the Clinton Global Initiative. We're creating a, tr a track with the CGI University with nearly 1,200 young leaders who are taking real concrete steps towards solving the global challenges and figuring out how to create jobs in, in this, in this uh, economic environment we're in, and really powering our economy forward. We're proud to be partnering with CGI in this effort, and I'm proud now to turn the stage over to a very special guest. I set up this foundation so that I could pursue causes that I could still have an impact on as a private citizen. So I picked the things that I cared about and I could do things that were quite important that governments normally don't do. You take any nation, you will find that intelligence and ability, aspiration, they're all evenly distributed across the society, but organization, investment, opportunity or not. When you get into this business, you, you have to recognize that a certain amount of humility is important.
governments with all their resources often fail to affect social change. So we're there to restore, if you will, the connection between people's efforts and actions and positive consequences. You can't possibly do that kind of work unless you do it with other people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Michael for inviting me down and for the announcement he just made about the partnership with the Clinton Gopal Initiatives University program. I'd like to thank Susan Dell for appearing last year at our Health Matters Conference out in Southern California, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I'm very grateful to Dell not only for being a part of the 21st century economy and helping to give us a model about how the, I believe the country and the world should proceed, but also for the mission reflected in their sponsorship of CGIU and their promotion of healthy habits and their participation in our Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which is dedicated to reversing the tide of childhood obesity, I think the number one public health problem in America. And you, everybody who's part of Dell, should be proud of the fact that their sponsorship of the Miami-Dade school program and one in Maryland is a part of the first evidence we have had just in the last week that at least in the largest cities that have been sampled, there has actually been the first discernible decline in the rate of childhood obesity in more than 30 years. So I'm very grateful for that. I, uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about how what you do and the way technology works, and specifically the way the Internet works, could be a model for dealing with a lot of the challenges we face in the 21st century that appear to have not much to do with technology. It's hard to believe, but we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of my inauguration as president. I'm getting older. When I became president, the average cell phone weighed five pounds. There were a grand total of 50 websites on the entire internet. That was it. More than that had been added since I started talking. I sent a grand total of two emails when I was president. One to our troops serving in the Balkans when we were trying to stop the ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Kosovo. One to John Glenn, who was up in space at the age of 77. Didn't hurt him any. He's now 92, still walks three or four miles every day. I had noticed that the Almost all the email early on was inner office traffic, and all the young people who were crazy for technology would type before they thought. And we had a relatively hostile Congress who thought that their number one job was to subpoena every email ever written by anybody who ever worked in my administration. So I sent two. I was glad to have them read them. That's all, it's all different now. But I'd like to talk about how all this fits into how I think the 21st century world works and the work I do now, a little of which you saw on the screen there. In a world that is still dominated in the daily headlines, 
by a conflict. What's going on in Egypt? What's going on in Syria? What's going to happen with China? Are we going to fight over natural resources in the Pacific? Is China going to divert the headwaters of the Mekong River and cause all kinds of problems for the countries in Southeast Asia? What about the Yellow River drying up for parts of the year? They built two gravity-driven canals taking water from the Yangtze River down to the Yellow River. Some Chinese engineers, not the Sierra Club, Chinese engineers, believe that it may wind up drying up both rivers at times of the year. In a world that seems to be full of zero-sum games and conflict models based on trying to hold on to a yesterday that can't be recovered, I believe the future belongs to networks of creative cooperation. I loved what, was, what Michael said right before I came up here about open sourcing. I love the way the Internet enables people to make unusual partnerships and to do things differently and to try and not to be afraid to fail and to go on and do something else. And I love it because of the way I think the world works and how the opportunities have to be seized and the problems have to be solved or ameliorated. Because, as all of you know, because you live in it, it's the most interdependent world in human history. There was actually a time slightly before World War I when the largest economies of the world actually were more trade dependent, slightly, than they are today. That is, when they had a larger percent of their GDP tied to trade than today. But there has never been a time when there was so much information, so many people, so many cultural ideas, so many political debates, so many security threats crossing national borders. They all seem to more look, like, look more like nets than walls. Israel can put up a fence dividing the West Bank from Gaza, but can't stop rockets from coming in, so they constructed an iron dome. That's what their missile defense is called. We help to pay for it and support them developing it. I like it, and it'll work for a while, but sooner or later, all the barriers of the world wind up looking more like nets than walls. And therefore, we are living in a world where we are compelled to share the future. Even things that don't seem to affect us directly are things we know about. That's why so many Americans were worried about all the innocent people dying in Darfur and in Congo. We can't shut each other out. We are compelled to share the future. So the real question is, how are we going to share it? And it seems to me that Every one of us has an obligation which can be fulfilled in myriad ways, maybe just in our own community, maybe in our state or our nation, maybe halfway around the world, to try to build up the positive and reduce the negative forces of global interdependence. The old order of things is shifting. Nation states still matter. Defense budgets still matter. All the things we used to think of as giving us security still matter, but they just don't give us as much of it as they used to. And we have to imagine a new future in which we try to create shared prosperity and shared responsibilities. And maybe most important of all, in which we try to still have a positive identity of ourselves, our families, the communities of which we are a part, the religious communities, the business communities, the political communities, that we have good feelings about that without feeling constrained to demonize those who are different. We have to find a way to build ever-inclusive communities. Many years ago now, although not all, about nine or ten years ago, a man named Robert Wright, who's a very gifted author, wrote a book called Non-Zero, which is, many of you know, is a term from game theory. A zero-sum game is now a college football game where they make you pay so many overtimes until somebody wins 
or everybody just drops right there on the field. Um, I'm from Arkansas. I remember a few years ago, Arkansas defeated Kentucky 71 to 63 in a six overtime game. Saved me the trouble from having to do anything else that day. <laughs> That's a zero sum. We like zero sum. We all do. Everybody who likes sports likes zero sum games. But non zero sum games are those in which you win by making sure everybody else wins. And those are far more relevant to our future. We will still have occasional combat. We will still avoid the zero-sum games. We'll still cheer for the poor stiff who has the winning lottery ticket. But if we want the world to work, we will have to create more non-zero-sum arrangements where we still have competition, we still reward those who work harder or have a new idea or are particularly gifted, but we share it. Uh, I, you heard that reference that was made. I think Michael made it to uh, — I was backstage because I wasn't, couldn't be sure exactly who he was talking, but I heard somebody say, we spent $3 billion to develop the human genome. Most of it I spent. It was your money, though. And now I was at uh, the St. Jude Medical Center in Memphis the other day, which is the largest children's cancer hospital in America. They have staff from over 100 countries, and, when, and they do a lot of actual applied research in the human genome, which in dealing with cancer patients, they now have down to $1,500 a process. And he said, or excuse me, 5,000. He said it would be down to 1,500 next year, and it'll soon be $500. And every time they, for, they have uncovered some remarkable things about how to treat children's cancer which is very important because they immediately open source it. They throw everything they find on the Internet and they send it to every children's hospital in the world. And that's important because a lot of people don't know this, but in the developing world, which we normally think of as afflicted by the things I work on, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, diarrhea, those kinds of things, the, the cancer rates are actually just as high as they are in the developed world. So they were treating this relatively rare f a kind of children's brain cancer. And if you get there soon enough, they now have an 85 percent cure rate. When St. Jude started, only 15 percent of the kids got well. So over 50 years, it's been an exponential improvement. And there was an FDA-approved drug that literally cured 100 percent of the kids, assuming they were treated diagnosed properly and treated soon enough, except for those it didn't cure, a minority of them, they all died. And they died sooner because of the drug. If it hadn't been for the human genome research, they would never have been able to find out why the drug, which guaranteed you a 100 percent cure rate, except when it didn't, actually helped to kill every kid that it couldn't cure. And miraculously, almost like an act of God, they discovered in all their desperate attempts to save the others that if you cut the FDA-approved drug dose in half, literally cut the dose in half, it would cure all the kids in the second group. But it wouldn't cure the kids in the first group, the majority group. So now, whenever someone is diagnosed with this cancer that comes into St. Jude, they do a genome test, and they find the variants, and they save those kids, too, at the same rate, with the same medicine, which for reasons that they don't yet know, but they can detect from the genome variances, in full dose would poison the kids in the smaller group. Now, That's a good thing, but it shows you the power of creative cooperation, because this genome research was done mostly by the scientists working in university laboratories, paid for mostly by governments, not just the United States, although we bore the lion's share of it. We had scientists from Europe, from the UK, from Japan, from elsewhere around the world in the coalition. And then Craig Venner headed a, and funded a parallel primary, uh, 
primary research effort, and then we joined them at the end, and we announced the first sequencing in 2000. He still, by the way, is active in this space and has a, his foundation out in San Diego, which is now the human genome research capital and development capital of the world. And between Venner and the biggest computer company out there, Qualcomm, they have spawned 700 new computer companies to do pieces of this applied human genome work, along with support from the state, the city, University of California at San Diego, networks of creative cooperation. Now, here we are in a world, the world I see has lots of interesting things. I just gave you one example. If you're interested in particle physics, you know, earlier this year, finally, at the CERN Superconducting Super Collider, which I tried to build in Texas, by the way. You may remember this. And when the, your former senior senator, the late Lloyd Benson, who became my first Treasury Secretary, came to me and said when we were trying to make a budget deal in 93, he said, we can't get the votes unless we give up the Super Collider. I said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Particle physics is going to determine a lot of our future, and it's not that much money. He said, congressmen who don't live in Texas think it is. I say that so you will have to hold your nose during this budget process, because politics isn't like science. They'll, it'll be ugly. And never forget that Mark Twain said the only thing people should never have to watch being made are sausage and laws. So anyway, we had to give it up, and we then contributed to an international effort that was moved to CERN, Switzerland, underground near the French border, the Alps. But they discovered the so-called God particle, the Higgs boson, which is believed to be at the core of matter and how all subatomic particles relate to each other. It was a happy day. It lasted for a millisecond in the history of the Earth until some bright guy said, yeah, I looked at it. It looks to me like there are two of them, and they're completely distinct. So then <laughs> every physicist in the world got a headache and said, oh, my God, just when we thought we had the answer, we don't. But they do have an answer. They're going on. And they're going on together in creative cooperation and creative competition. We learned this year, thanks to the human genome studies, that unless your ancestors are 100 percent from Sub-Saharan Africa, which includes nearly no one in Sub-Saharan Africa, much less anywhere else. Unless they're 100 percent from Sub-Saharan Africa, between 1 and 4 percent of our genome comes from our pre-human ancestors, the Neanderthals. So I, my little family loves all this science stuff, so I called Hillary and Chelsea immediately, brimming with this, because I saw the article before they did, and they informed me that they were not the least bit surprised to know that I was part Neanderthal. They could have told the scientists that before the research started. <laughs> they were, however, surprised to find that they were, too. What happened? Human beings rose up on the East African savanna somewhere between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago. It took them about 90,000 years to work their way out of Africa, first into North Africa, then into the Middle East, then east to Asia, west to Europe, eventually over the land bridge that used to connect Russia with Alaska, and then all the way down south to Tierra del Fuego, which is why there are 15,000-year-old preserved skeletons in the high mountains of Peru. And 40,000 of those years found the humans and the Neanderthals cohabiting the Earth. And it turns out they liked each other better than we knew. And they had progeny. And the, the Neanderthals were bigger than we were. They were stronger than we are, were. They seemed to have big brains. But as far as we can determine, they never learned to speak or write. They did make tools. And we probably survived, and they didn't, because it was a time of huge mammals. All the mammals on Earth today, except the very largest ones, 
would be puny by the standards of 100,000 years ago, not to mention millions of years ago in pre-human times. And it appears that we survived because we could run faster than that, than they could. You know that old joke about the two guys that come up on the bear in the woods and one of them takes off running and the other one said, you fool, you can't outrun the bear. And the other guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. So it seems that we outran the bear. So this is a great time to be alive because of all of this stuff we're learning that will have enormous practical implications. Then there are things that may or may not have practical applications. The Hubble telescope and other space exploration technology have given us not just what we're finding out with the Mars rover, but just from long distance sighting, the identification of over 10 planets beyond our solar system, which seem to have a texture enough like Earth and to be far enough away from their sun to at least potentially support life. So those of you who are younger in the crowd may find out we're not alone in the universe after all. That's a problem I will not address today. You can figure it out when it happens. But the point is, there are a lot of good things about this world. Can you imagine? We could not have had this meeting 50 years ago. There were no companies like Dell. This company started in 1984 and is at a ripe old age compared to a lot of the companies in the information technology space. But the world that brought all of you into this great hall today and gave you a chance to make your careers as you were making them has three huge problems, which, if unaddressed, could still cloud, if not your future, your children or your grandchildren's future. First of all, it is too unequal. If you believe, as I do, that intelligence and the willingness to work, the willingness to dream, the willingness to imagine and act on your imagination are evenly distributed, the fact that the world is unequal and in many places, including the United States, growing more unequal in terms not just of incomes, but access to education, health care, the capital to start a new business, in almost every index, it should bother you because that is a severe constraint on growth. America was the great economic engine of the latter half of the 20th century because after World War II, we used both the industrial might we built up in the war and the great huge population advantage we got from the baby boom and the wisdom of our forebears to create the GI Bill to try to create a much higher mass of people with university educations than ever before to create the biggest middle class the world had ever known. And it turned out that the civil rights laws and the laws advancing women's rights and the increasing number of immigrants in America, all of which were opposed by some people who felt threatened by them, they all helped because they kept widening the circle of opportunity and therefore making markets work better because there were more producers and more consumers. It turned out to be good economics even for people who couldn't quite handle the politics at the time. In other words, even when we didn't want to do it, we were building more non-zero-sum societies by expanding the number of people who were us and shrinking the number of people who were in the them category. Then the Cold War ended and created a whole lot of new opportunities and new challenges, so I will move to that. But the world, you can't, you can't build a global marketplace in a world where Half the people are still living on $2 a day or less, where a billion people go to bed hungry, a billion people have no access to clean water, two and a half billion people don't have any access to sanitation. That's really what happened in the cholera epidemic in Haiti, where more than 100 million kids don't go to school and at least that many more go in name only because they have no access to trained teachers or learning materials. And in America, don't forget, 
the jobs model had slowed down so much in the first decade of the 21st century that on the day before the financial crisis, before the crash, that was September 15, 2008, our economy had only produced 2.6 million jobs and median family income before the crash was an inflation-adjusted $2,000 lower than it was the day I left office. Poverty was up again. So both within America and around the world, we have to find a way to create more shared prosperity and less inequality. The second problem we have is there's too much instability. Now, if you believe in market economics, and I do, and I think most of you do, because it helps you get where you are today. It's still the best way of reducing poverty, giving people a job and, a, and reward for their labor. It's enabled to China's move to more market-oriented policies, has lifted more people out of poverty within a 20-year period than any device in human history. And you have to have a little inequality because you have to reward people who get there first. You have to work, reward people who work harder. You have to reward people who can run complex systems. And then, since we all like to have fun, we want to reward the people who entertain us in the movies and music and sports. I mean, you, that you, you, you can't imagine any sort of market economy with no inequality. And you have to have some instability. To have the prospect of reward for starting a new company there has to be this prospect of failure. When the bankruptcy laws were first introduced, in effect, one of the reasons for doing it is so you can make the market more efficient. People could pay their debts as best they could and begin again so that we didn't have more and more people mired in the past as either debtors or debt collectors that you could clear the books, work it out, and begin again. You've got to have some instability. But if you have too much instability, it's like having none at all. Both extremes shut things down and make people entirely too risk averse. So you, you saw that after the financial crisis, which began in America, spread overseas in a hurry, encompassed eventually virtually all the countries in the world, and pretty soon, we had the best capitalized banks we'd had in 20 years overcoming the problems that were the proximate cause, but not the only cause of the financial crisis. And the banks had $2 trillion in cash uncommitted to loans because they were reluctant to lend and people were reluctant to borrow. Because having too much leverage, having the financial crash spooked people and there was so much instability, there might as well have been no instability at all, because nothing was happening. That's really what terrorists hope to do when they can kill a few thousand people, as they did on 9-11. It was a horrible day, but you know, in World War I, there were probably 200 days where more people than that were killed, maybe more. Lots more. 900,000 people died at the Battle of the Somme. In World War II, 800,000 people starved at, or were killed at Stalingrad. But we were organized and active in the war. It was awful. I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just trying to say the reason people try to pull off terrorist incidents is not only to kill the people they consider their enemies, but to shut the rest of the target down, to spread instability, insecurity, and to shut down. That's how organized criminals who traffic in drugs or in people try to operate. They try to be, in effect, a counterstate that can <clears throat> evade systems and, when necessary, cause enough violence that the price of getting them outweighs the price of letting them operate. They try to maintain excessive instability in law enforcement, immigration, and other systems so that they can do it. So what we have to do is to figure out how you can have 
sufficient instability for us to thrive in freedom and creativity with the chance to fail as well as the chance to succeed, and not so much that we shut down. And the final problem we have is that the world is unsustainable because of the way we produce and consume energy, because climate change is occurring. I happened to be in Northern California last week with <clears throat> the last truly highly respected climate skeptic, Dr. Richard Muller, a physicist at Berkeley, who was, whose climate project was given a lot of money to try to debunk what more than 90 percent of the climate scientists believe, which is that global warming is real, it's accelerating, it's caused by us, and we better find a way to do something about it, to consume less and produce energy differently, and still grow. <coughs> Muller had a very common sense objection to the prevailing consensus. He said, I think too many of these temperature measurements are taken in or near cities. And we all know when you got more people and you got more underground heat systems, cities are warmer than small towns and rural areas. Hillary and I live in a, a house in a small town 20 miles or so north of New York City. And there are lots of days when I get in the car and I drive down to work, and it's 10 degrees warmer when I get out of the car than it was when I got in. We've all had this experience, right? So Mueller did this. And a lot of the climate skeptics, including the Koch brothers, funded his research. And the organized denial movement was ecstatic. I mean, here they got a professor from the Socialist Republic of Berkeley about to debunk this horrible myth of climate change so we can go on and do what we're doing. So on the appointed day, he notified the Republican head of the relevant committee in the House that he had finished his research because they had asked him to present it, who I think is Ralph Hall from Texas. And he showed up, and all the climate denialists on the committee were there. They thought, oh, happy day. We will grind them in the dirt. And Mueller got up and he said, well, I did it. I did three billion temperature measurements. I corrected for all the errors I thought every other study had made. And I have reached a firm conclusion. They were right, and I was wrong. Global warming is real. It's proceeding at an unsustainable rate, and it's man-made. There is no other reasonable conclusion. He said, now, Mueller's a conservative. He said, now, I do think we need a conservative liberal debate here, but the debate ought to be how best to deal with this problem, not whether it exists or not. We need that. Twenty, almost 22 years ago, a conservative government in Sweden adopted the world's most radical libertarian carbon tax. They figured out what the price of carbon was in 1991, and they figured out what everybody's carbon burden was, and they sent you a tax to cover it. So you would get a $5,000 tax, you would get a $10,000 tax, this business would get a $100,000 tax, another one a $20,000 tax. And then they did an amazing thing. They said, we believe that Swedes are inherently responsible. We are a community committed to the survival of our nation and our world. Here's your money back. A hundred percent of the money. You get it all back. And they said, we just wanted you to know what you're doing to the future, and we trust you. So if you decide to spend this money exactly as you have before, have at it. Go on and burn us up. We don't think you'll do that. And amazingly, just six years later, when the Kyoto Climate Change Treaty passed, and all the other wealthy countries in the world were given a target that they were supposed to reduce their greenhouse gases below 1990 level, the Swedish target was a 4 percent increase. Between 1997 and 2010, they grew their economy 50 percent more 
and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions 7 percent more, almost 100 percent through efficiency. Oh, they got a little solar, a little wind, but nowhere near what Denmark or Germany or other countries have done. And they did it with this totally revenue-neutral carbon tax. Everybody got their money back. Now, you have to have a pretty strong sense of social solidarity and a pretty literate citizenry to do that. But the point is, that's the sort of debate we ought to be having. Now, if the world that we live in is a great place in many ways, but it is too unequal, too unstable, and too unsustainable, we need to figure out how to minimize the negative things and maximize the positive ones. And I, I want to just make one or two comments about that, and we'll go to questions. Number one, there is a fundamental difference in the way you do that in a very poor country and an already well-developed one. Poor countries need systems that we take for granted, systems that reward good conduct with predictable positive results. I'll, I'd be very surprised if anyone here since this meeting started, since I started my talk, has even thought about the possibility that the screen could go dark, or the lights could fail, or the microphone would fail, or the air controls would go on the blink. If you're really bored with my speech, you can get up and go to the bathroom. While there, the all probability, if there's a glass there, you could drink a glass of water and not think a thing about it. I spend a lot of my life in places where people cannot take any of that for granted. One of the most interesting trips I've taken in the last few years was to one of our reforestation projects in a very hot community in Tanzania where none of the kids went to school, the per capita income was less than a dollar a day, but they had devised a very innovative way of reforestation and sharing the revenues they got from an international fund as a result of it. It took me an hour and a half to go 18 kilometers, about 11 miles. And uh, when I was a younger man, I could have jogged it faster than that. But they're out there, smart people, trying to find their way to a future, trying to give their kids. They need systems, the things we take for granted. Rich countries have systems. That's how we all got in our chairs. They need reform. Because the real dilemma in all rich societies, and you see it today in all the hand-wringing in the EU and the United States and the slow growth in Japan and all of that, is that at some point in the development of every society, and you can go back 8,000 years and look at what happened to the Sumerians. This is, this is human nature. This is not some inherent flaw in Americans. Society's systems become more interested in holding on to what they got than creating the future, more interested in protecting the prerogatives of the people benefiting from it than advancing the purposes for which they were established. That's one of the reasons that I like um, what we're doing in the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, one of the reasons I'm grateful to the Dell Foundation. I brought in all the, uh, the big soft drink manufacturers, and I said, you realize a huge percentage of these poor, overweight kids are getting more than half their calories just from the drinks they consume in school. And I do not believe you want to kill them. I know you don't. I do not believe you have somebody working in your corporation telling you every day that X percent of these kids are going to be diabetic by the time they're 12, and Y percent by the time they're 30, and all these people we'd like to be our customers in middle age aren't going to be able to drink soft drinks because they're going to be broke, and so is America with the health care costs they're going to impose on us. You didn't do that. This is a highly complex problem. So let's figure out how to create a different future in which all of you still make money in a different way. And we got rid of all the full sugar soft drinks. We reduced the portion size of the juices, which have a lot of sugar in them, particularly if they're not freshly squeezed. 
went to a lot of fruit-flavored waters and did some other things. We just got an independent review that said that in the five years since this has been going on, there has been a 90 percent reduction in the total calories served to children in cafeterias and in vending machines in 98 percent of the schools in America. That is a stunning thing. That's the kind of thing that we have to do more of, reforming the system. And what did it? Not a law, not a tax, not a regulation, and not the free market, but a creative network of cooperation. And the same thing is true with a lot of other things. I, uh, I'm grateful for the support of the Dell Foundation of the Clinton Global Initiative University because I think young people have good ideas. And I'm grateful that Michael and Susan's son, Zach, is on the Alliance for Healthy Generations Youth Advisory Board. We get some of the best ideas we get from people under 18. We've had people as young as 11 or 12 on this board who figured out how to change the eating and exercise habits. We're, we work in 15,000 schools now. And I try to use that model in other ways. Um, Susan spoke last year at this Health Matters conference we had in California. We now have a program to try to do the same thing for the baby boomers and for the population at large we were doing in the schools. Because the truth is that I'm the oldest of the baby boomers. I'm 66 now. Everybody born from 46 to 64 is a baby boomer. We are so numerous that if we consume health care dollars at the same percentage that our, the previous generation did, no matter what happens in this Washington debate or what happens to the health cost control efforts at the grassroots level, many of which are very encouraging, we're going to break the bank. We have to stay healthier, and we're determined to figure out how to do it. So that's the kind of thing that we have to do. We have to apply that to the economy. The Dell Social Innovation Challenge, 25,000 students from over 100 countries have competed over 800 of you have volunteered to participate as judges and mentors. That's what the world needs. My first friend in Austin, Texas was Roy Spence. We've been friends for more than 40 years now. And he and Judy Trabolsi, two of the founders of GSDNM, which those of you from Austin know well, probably is Idea City now, have set up this program called Dream It, Build It to sustain a website and an outreach to inspire, mentor, and challenge literally hundreds of thousands of new young entrepreneurs over the next five years. That's the sort of thing we have to do. And I could give you many other examples. I just I want to go to questions, but I'll close with this. None of this is going to happen unless we can find a way to have a non-zero-sum solution to the identity crisis itself. A few years ago, I read a fascinating book by a journalist from Austin who was a self-identified liberal Democrat named Bill Bishop called The Big Sort, S-O-R-T. I'll come, I'll come to the end. I'll give you the conclusion first. Bishop said, hey, this is a great country. We are so much less racist and sexist and homophobic than we used to be. We have gotten rid of all of our bigotries except one. We just don't want to be around anybody that disagrees with us. And the book is full of, I mean, literally, you'll be rolling in the aisles when you read some of this. He tells a story of a developer who wanted to build an upscale development east of uh, L.A. and the Inland Empire, and he did this complicated socioeconomic study to see if there were enough people who would buy these homes, and he found out there were, except they were equally divided between liberals and conservatives. And so he did this daring experiment. He built all the houses on the left for the conservatives, pools and basketball goals in the back, 
lots of yard for kids to play in. He built the houses on the right for the liberals. Every one of them had a yoga room. And, you know, you're laughing a sauna and, you know, a different kind of sound system. And then they all sold out. Then he went back and they polled everybody. And sure enough, everybody on the left was a conservative and everybody on the right was a liberal. He talked about losing his neighbor in Austin, who was the only Republican on his block. And he said, John Kerry beat Governor then President Bush in 2004, three to one on our block. He moved to a place where President Bush beat John Kerry four to one, and both of us were poorer. We have got to learn to live with difference and still feel good about ourselves. So I leave you with this thought. There is an international network of private business school called the HALT Network, H-U-L-T. They too are part of our Clinton Global Initiative. And their commitment is to give a cash award every year to between one and three business school teams, not just theirs, anybody from our economics departments, from anywhere in the world, writes a case study about how to solve a problem. So last year, the problem was Okay, photovoltaic cells are already economical in countries that don't have electrical systems because their kilowatt hour charges for building these new systems are so high that it makes sense right now. But we have no distribution network. How would you put up 20 million in a year in really poor places? And we got some fascinating proposals, but the winning proposal was from New York University's campus in Abu Dhabi in the Middle East. And there were four people on the team, one from India and one from Pakistan, one from China and one from Taiwan. They're on the team, and I go every year and give out the prizes. So I said, are you sure you guys want to come up here together and take a picture with me and have it in the hometown paper? Everybody was laughing except them. They said, we've talked about this. We are so over this. This is crazy. That's about yesterday. We're about tomorrow. If we can get back in the tomorrow business and do it together, we're going to be just fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. You, you laid out um, What happened? I'm not sure. Oh, the boots. There we go. Oh, these we boots go. were given to me by the president of the University of Texas student body when we had the uh, Clinton Global Initiative for Students here in Austin at UT a few years ago. It was literally my booty for bringing the conference here. So whenever I come here, I wear them. But I wear boots all the time, which is unsettling to some people in New York, but they're quite comfortable. And my two favorite pair of these, and oh, a pair I bought in El Paso in 2008. So a few months ago in, in Time Magazine, you laid out the case for optimism. Tell, tell us why you're optimistic about our world today. Well, first of all, I think that the availability of technology to short circuit the otherwise very lengthy process of building effective systems can make a real difference. I'll just, let me just give you two examples. A couple years ago, the World Bank did a study that said every 10% increase in cell phone penetration in a developing country adds six-tenths of 1% to GDP. So when I started working for the UN in Haiti and then we had the earthquake, one of the things that I immediately saw, because Hillary and I went there on a delayed honeymoon trip there in 1975, and I've kept up with the country since then, is that I was going to have a heck of a time 
building any kind of a middle class and giving poor people a ladder into it because the banks were basically highly oligopolistic and not service oriented. About 20% of Haiti's GDP comes from remittances. Where Haitians working in the U.S. and other countries, they send their money home. If you run a bank, it's like clipping, clipping coupons. All you got to do is charge a fee to turn that money into the local currency, and then you just put your feet up, and you don't have to hit a lick. So they were charging 45% to 6% interest for a small business loan. There was no home mortgage system, and there was no consumer banking services. So we got Scotiabank, a Canadian bank, and Digicel, the largest cell phone company, to team up because very few Haitians had a bank account, but almost all of them had a cell phone. So they offered basic banking services, and it exploded. And all of a sudden, we began to have the, begin, uh, the, the makings of a real consumer economy. After the tsunami in South Asia in late 2004, I spent a couple of years working there. And the, the people who made their living fishing in Sri Lanka, in, principally in Sri Lanka and in Aceh, in Indonesia, we replaced their boats. But in addition to that, we made sure they all got a cell phone. And by simply having a cell phone and knowing what the market price of fish was every single day up to 30 to 40 miles away, the average increase in income with that cell phone for these fishers was 30 percent. So I'm optimistic because of that. I'm optimistic in spite of the current troubles with the movement toward democracy in the world. I still think, you know, we have to create global citizens, and you can't do it if people are disempowered. But unfortunately, all these new democracies, like the Arab Spring, you see this in Egypt today, one of the hardest things on the path to building a true democracy is convincing the people who win elections that a democracy is way more than majority rule. It's also minority rights, individual rights, and the rule of law. And particularly if a religious party wins an election, they, there's a great article in the New York Times today on this, in Egypt today. There's a tendency to think, OK, we now get to do whatever we want to whomever we want, under whatever circumstances we want. But before you get too negative about it, remember, when America won its independence and ratified its constitution, only white male property owners could vote. It wasn't just the African Americans, the slave population, and the free blacks who couldn't vote. It was only males and only males who owned property. Now, the problem is we need to fast forward there, too. They can't afford to take as long as we did to figure out all this. And there's too much evidence around the world that will modify it. But that's what you see in Egypt today, this sort of groaning, growing plane. So one day, Mr. Morsi's a hero because he helps to broker a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The next day, he's a goat because he wants to be a dictator and repeal the judicial system. The next day, he's doing a little better because he repealed some of it. He re evokes some of what he did. This is the groaning, growing pains. But on balance, increased empowerment of people is a good thing. I'm encouraged because of the growing prominence of uh, gender issues, girls in school, access of young women to the labor markets, the end of the necessity of ending trafficking in people. I think the fact that this is a huge front burner issue in the world is really important. And there are lots of other reasons. I'll just give you one. I'm encouraged because I believe that in the developing world, it is already highly economical to bring power to people through clean energy and sustainable sources. Uh, to, and I think that we have four or five avenues that we could take, both in wealthy and poor countries, that would accelerate the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and accelerate the economy at the same time. Austin's trying to become a green city. Dell's trying to become a totally green company. I was just in Arkansas at the largest 
a manufacturer of eyeline makeup in the world, L'Oreal's Maybelline plant in Arkansas. It's a, they make more eyeliner there than any place in the world. And the company had a goal of 50% reduction in water, 50% reduction in non-emitting, I mean, in greenhouse gas emitting electricity, and a 50% reduction in waste by 2015. This 37-year-old plant that I used to visit as a governor has already had a 50% reduction in electricity, a 50% reduction in water, and a 38% reduction in waste three years ahead of time. So those are the reasons that I'm optimistic. America I'm optimistic on because we're younger than Europe, we're younger than Japan, we'll be younger than China in 20 years if they don't change their one-child policy and their immigration policy. And if we will get smart about the right kind of immigration reform, we will have a country that grows younger still. So that's why I'm optimistic. Will crazy things happen? Will politicians do dumb things with young people drunk with power with no economic options in North Africa and other places, kill people they shouldn't? Yeah, bad things are about will happen, will continue to happen. But on balance, I think the world will trend in the right direction. You know, we've seen in our, in our own business that um, efforts to reduce energy consumption and make our business more sustainable is actually an enormous opportunity with uh, just some focus and attention. And I think more and more organizations are, are paying attention to that. You know, when, when, when you think about uh, the job environment and how do you create sustainable jobs, you know, what do you think the private sector can do and uh, companies can, can do, you know, to, to really play a role there. And, and tell us what you see the role of small, medium-sized businesses in, in, in the world today. That's an area that uh, is very interesting to, to a lot of the people here. Well, first, I think the government needs to reimagine all of its systems and how they interface with the business community. And we need a partnership here to get us on a budget that we can afford. The real problem with the federal, first of all, look, more than 50% of this deficit is overhang from the financial crash. Because whenever you have a crash this bad, revenues go down. They're below 15% of GDP. If we just had normal economic growth, the current tax structure would produce about 17% of GDP. Expenditures have been as high as 24.5% of GDP. If we had normal economic growth, food stamp expenditures would go down, unemployment expenditures would go down, a number of other expenditures would go down to probably 21% of GDP. Do we need to close the rest of that gap? Yes. And do we need to avoid it widening because of the retirement of the baby boomers? Yes. But we need to do this in a way that is sensible. And I'll just give you one example. That uh, I raised the corporate income tax when I was president. But it was 1993, a long time ago. And when we raised it, we raised it to precisely the international average of wealthy countries. I said, I don't want to go a dollar above the average. I don't want us ever to become uncompetitive. It was then 35%. The average now is 25 percent or 26. And that's one of the reasons that American companies have about a trillion dollars overseas they haven't repatriated, because we also apply the difference between local tax rates and the American tax rates if cash is repatriated. And Canada just changed their rule last year, so now we're the only country among the wealthy countries of the world that do that. So what I'd like to see done is a deal made on this where we lower the corporate. Now, let me just say this. If you take a company like, I, I don't know enough about your situation, take um, Dow Chemical. It's a great company, headquartered in Michigan, now making shingles for modest incomes homes that have solar panels in them. They're moving jobs back to America because in manufacturing, it's so productive. Labor is constantly a lower percentage of your overall cost. 
and energy materials and supply chain transportation issues are higher. But they pay pretty much 35 percent. Exxon last year is an important American company, but most of their jobs are not necessarily in America. They paid a total of 17. So clearly there's a lot of opportunity in effect to lower that rate and then have a de facto alternative minimum tax to do it. And I would like to see a deal made which would say to Dell and everybody else, if you've got any cash overseas you're willing to bring home, you can bring home every penny of it earned up to December 31st, 2012, the end of this year, with no extra tax liability if you're clean there. If you will put, pick a number, 8% of it, 5% of it, in an infrastructure bank where we will guarantee you a tax-free return on investment as if it were a municipal bond of 6% a year or whatever. Now, that would give us probably $50 billion. If you did that, then all these pension funds would rush to put money in it because they need guaranteed ROIs so they can make their payment schedule for the next few years. Then we could bring, for example, something that would help your business. We could bring universal modern broadband to every American. We like that. You want to help, you want to help small businesses? You want to help new entrepreneurs? You want to make it possible for people living in remote towns in upstate New York or West Texas to be part of the global economy? Then stop pretending we can do it with South Korea having average download speeds of four times ours. They're first in the world. We're now 15th or 16th. That's not that expensive. Use it to modernize the electrical grid. Texas, on a good day, will get 25% of its electricity from wind. But there's enough wind blowing from the Canadian border with North Dakota to the West Texas border with Mexico to electrify America a jillion times over. I'll never forget when I was campaigning for Hillary in 2008, I was down in Del Rio and Eagle Pass the night before the election, standing on the back of a pickup truck, and I nearly got blown off the wind. I said, how fast is the wind blowing? They said, 45 miles an hour. I said, how often does it blow this fast? They said, every night. I said, Texas is the number one state in the country with windmills. I always kid George W. Bush, who's become a friend of mine. I said, you know, back in your proto-socialist phase as governor of Texas, you gave tax exemption, uh, tax credits for people to put up these windmills. It's turned out to be a heck of a deal for you. But there weren't any there. And I asked why, and they said, because we have power lines here, but all the towns are small, and they don't have the capacity to wheel the power back to where the people are. So if we modernize the electrical grids, we could create a lot of jobs. Uh, the largest number of jobs we could create for small businesses would be in retrofitting every physical structure in America that hasn't gone through an energy retrofit and that, unlike Dell, doesn't have the cash reserves to finance it now and say it's okay if it doesn't pay out for six years or seven years. We're in this for the long run, and seven years from now when our power drills drop 30 percent because we're hyper-efficient, it's going to be great. When my foundation worked on the, uh, with Johnson Controls and a number of other countries, companies, on retrofitting the Empire State Building, built in 1931. It's the only Leeds building that big and that old in the world. And in two years, we put 275 people to work full-time on this, did everything, cut their power bills. Johnson Control guaranteed 38 percent, which means we're going to have a 40 percent reduction in the electric bill and a 40 percent reduction in the emissions. And that's a heck of a lot of jobs. You get approximately 7,000 jobs for every billion dollars invested in energy efficiency. Wind energy, 3,300. If you build the windmills in their entirety in the country, 1,900 for solar, less than 900 for coal and nuclear. The job thing, it's not close. The most efficient way is to do what Sweden started doing in 1991 and quit wasting energy, put in new HVAC systems and everything else, lighting systems, temperature and lighting controls when people leave the rooms. Uh, there's money there and jobs there. And so that's where I would begin. I think we have time for one more question. You, you referenced the budget issues and 
uh, in the news a lot, obviously, is this fiscal cliff. Tell us your thoughts. Do you think this kind of immediate impending issue gets resolved before the end of the year? And longer term, how do we get ourselves out of this mess where you know, we're spending much more than we're taking in? Well, first, I think, well, let me just back up in case some younger people here forgot. I hate all this debt. I tried to get us out of debt. We'd have been out of debt by 2013, maybe it would have been delayed a little bit. I mean, literally no public debt if we hadn't both increased spending and cut the tax levels from where I had it. When I left office, we were taxing at about 19.5 percent of GDP and spending at about 18.5. And we were projected to be to save $5 trillion in surplus funds in the next 10 years and actually to pay off all of our debt somewhere between 2011 and 2015. Literally be debt free. And the reason I wanted to do that is to maximize the options for the next generation. I had a big argument with Alan Greenspan, who was supposed to be more conservative than me. He said, you can't do that. How will we ever peg a bond rate if we paid all our public debt off? I said, you're smart enough to figure that out. All I know is the baby boomers are retiring. We haven't figured out how to handle it. And we've got to continue to be a future country. So then if we run a little deficit, it should be investing in the future. For example, there's a big difference. Think about your own budget. If you want to buy a car on credit or you have to buy a house on credit, that's okay. Why? Because the value of the asset you buy lives longer than the timeline it takes you to pay for it. It's an investment. That's how you should think of us building uh, the world's best broadband network or a modern electrical grid or a new highway system or repairing our bridges or investing in education. But if you borrow, if every single night you go out to eat and you put it on a credit card that you can't balance every month, that ain't good. So there's a difference in debt. The problem with uh, the United States is that before the financial crash, we were back to doing that. For the first time in our history, we cut taxes and fought war. We had never done that before. Nobody does that. But there was this ideological notion that there was no such thing as a good tax and no such thing as a bad tax cut. And I remember one of um, the president's economic advisors actually gave a talk with a straight face about what a wonderful favor we were doing for China to take all that loose money off their hands. So I could have more disposable income. So I don't like this debt. But here's the problem. The political system presents the following three problems. Do I think there'll be an agreement? I do. Good. Uh, first, I think there will be. Look, if, if the president and the speaker would not be meeting alone, guaranteeing that they'll both look like abject failures unless they were trying to get a deal, the fiscal cliff legislation would not have passed unless the people who voted for it wanted a deal. That is, they were both saying, we're going to have to do things that our political bases don't like, so we got to create something even uglier saying, I did this really ugly thing, but oh, stand on the edge of this cliff and look down. <laughs> this whole deal was set up so there would ultimately be an agreement. So you should be right. happy about that. I think there'll be an agreement. Even if we fall off the cliff on January the 1st, they'll figure out some fix to get us back on it again, and they'll make a deal sometime in the next few weeks. That's what I predict. The speaker, Mr. Boehner, may decide that even though the Democrats only gained, I think, eight or nine seats in the House, whatever it was, the composition of the House will be different, and the people that were elected this time in both parties were elected by an electorate that was virtually screaming at them to work together, as opposed to the people who were elected in 2010, a smaller, different electorate, who were virtually screaming at them to go up and beat the living daylights out of the people on the other side. So 
One problem, my fellow citizens, is our fault. We vote more heavily in presidential elections than non-presidential election years. And that's why there are all these efforts to try to reduce the vote turnout this time to make it look more like 2010. That's nuts. And we have failed our duty, as all of us should be civics teachers in this, to tell people every time they open the polls, you're supposed to show up. And we need to make it more user-friendly. But anyway, so I think there'll be — they may wait till next year early, but there'll be a deal, I think. I think there are three big problems I'd like you to consider, because one of them you can have a big impact on. One is that the liberals who say the debt isn't that big a problem because interest rates are below inflation, people are basically paying us to hold their money because they think as weak as we are, we're the strongest economy in the world, are right today. And uh, conservatives and deficit hawks who, like me, hate this debt, and say, if you don't do something about this, all hell's going to break loose. They're right. And so it's very hard for our political system to walk and chew gum at the same time, to do multiple tasks. The right there, because let's just take Mark Zandi, who was one of John McCain's economic advisors, runs a company called Moody's Analytics, and he predicts there'll be 12 million jobs in the next four years if we just don't mess up anything. Well, let's just assume that's right. It's good news for us. Assume that's right. What does that mean? Somewhere along the path from where we are now to 12, maybe it's at the 3 million job, maybe it's at the 4 million job. To keep getting those jobs, they'll have to be more credit extended. More of these small businesses you're talking about will have to be able to go down to the bank and get a loan at an affordable interest rate. As soon as that happens, there will be intense competition between the public sector and the private sector that will drive interest rates through the roof unless we have already adopted a 10-year budget plan with credibility. On the other hand, if you do it too soon, like if we had severe austerity now on the public sector, you could be like the UK and the EU, which has an unemployment rate three points higher than ours, and drag America back toward recession because there there's insufficient private activity. So the right thing to do is basically what the simpson bowles Commission recommended. Adopt a 10-year plan, start slow with the austerity, calculate as best you can when the thing's going to pick up, and really put the hammer down. And make sure this plan has credibility and people know it's not going to be changed except to make it better. Then that will mitigate the impact of higher interest rates in the future. Now, this is really important. And let's suppose you're a liberal Democrat and you, you think the government ought to spend money on education and science and technology. I do. You should really be for doing this. Why? Because if interest rates today were what they averaged when I was president, instead of $230 billion a year, which is what our interest obligations are today, it would be $650 billion a year. $420 billion more. That affects — that will affect everything. That's a huge percentage of the budget. So what we need is a long-term plan that starts slow, picks up steam. And you need to get both those things. Second thing is this, and this is where I think Dell should be active in this space. As I said in my remarks, the hardest thing to do is to keep an old country in the future business. And whether we like it or not, we're, we've been around more than 200 years. Singapore, with 5 million people, just put up $5 billion to try to take world leadership and biotechnology away from us. They are living in the future. Now, we're trying to catch up. Best thing I've read in a long time is that our elementary school students in the international tests trail only Singapore and Taiwan in math, and only three countries in English. We're back at the top of the world in the education of fourth graders, according to the latest comparative test. That's really good news. Really good news. But there's a big gap at the eighth grade and a gaping chasm at the eleventh grade, 
and that doesn't even count the dropout, which makes it worse. But it's the beginning. Now, here's the thing. The money we spend on education, including Secretary Duncan's race to the top, are promoting charter schools like the KIPP schools, everything that's really, you know, showing progress. The money we spend on research and development, like the money we spend on sequencing the human genome. All that is in a category called non-defense discretionary spending. It's less than 15 percent of the total money you pay in taxes. It's less than the defense budget, less than Medicare, less than Medicaid, soon be probably already less than interest on the debt. But it's the easiest to cut. Why? Because the future never has a lobby as strong as the present. That's why in the recent campaign, for example, you had Governor Romney uh, advocating basically military Keynesianism. He said, you know, we're going to balance the budget in 10 years and we're going to start with a tax cut and by spending $2 trillion more on defense than the Pentagon asked for. Because people don't think of defense spending as government spending and people think surely it'll be good and it's a good deal. You never have to close any military bases or shut down any weapon systems. You just keep doing more. So this is a problem. You need to preserve our R&D budget. We need to spend more. We're, we're now down below 3 percent of GDP and R&D. We should never be below 3 percent of GDP and R&D. We need to keep those universities out there working with private companies, trying to develop commercially viable new solutions to the challenges we face. We don't need to cut back on early childhood education because that's one of the reasons our fourth graders are catching up. So there's 15 percent. I would like to see this huge bipartisan coalition saying, you know, cut the kids last. Cut the future last. We realize they don't have any K Street lobbies. We, but it's, come on, let's get a life here. It's only a small percentage of the budget. And for, even under President Obama's budget, non-defense discretionary spending would be the smallest percent of GDP in the aggregate. It's been in 50 years. And I understand why. He doesn't think there's any other way he can make an agreement with the Republicans, given their aversion to new taxes, and with the Democrats, given their aversion to fooling with Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. I get it, but it's not good for us. And so we need to keep preserve the future budget. I think that's important. And here's the third problem, and I haven't figured out how to do this with any existing law. What I wish they'd do on all the senior stuff that they're worried about and Medicaid, which is a health care program, is not to do what the Republicans want, which is to raise the retirement age of Medicare to 67, but not to do what the Democrats want, which is basically hope that all these cost control initiatives and incentives that are in the health care plan will work. They are beginning to work, by the way. We just had two years of 4 percent inflation in health care costs for the first time in 51 years. But you can't pass a credible budget based on hope. On the other hand, just to, to I'll give you the Medicare example. It might work fine if it triggers in in 10 years, but you don't know that. Right now, if you raise the retirement age on Medicare, here's what would happen. Everybody on Medicare would have to pay more out of pocket to buy into a health care program that's more expensive. And it would make the government's book look better, but it would hurt our competitive position further because the real one of the biggest problems the United States has in creating a competitive economy which includes pay raises every year is that in the last decade and for most of the last 30 years medical costs have gone up at a, an average of three times the rate of overall inflation there's a huge article on the front page of USA Today sometime in the last couple of months saying you want to know why nobody got a pay raise in the last decade because their employers wanted to raise their pay but the medical costs were so high they couldn't afford to. So, and the Republicans who want to raise the age level basically think for all their 
odes to American entrepreneurialism, this is the one problem we can't solve. We just have to spend literally a trillion dollars more on health care than we would spend if we had any other country's health system. Just last week, another study came out saying $750 billion a year is spent. That's a third of what we spend. It has no medical purpose at all. It doesn't make us live longer or live healthier. So what I would like to see is for the Democrats agree that if all else fails, we will do whatever is necessary to meet certain spending targets that bring health care costs more in line with inflation. And for the Republicans agree to give us time to use some of these models that have worked to dramatically cut cost to implement them throughout the country. I'll just give you, if I could, I'll give you two examples. I know we're running out of time. We have somewhere between 30 and 40,000 people a year die in hospitals every year or die as a result of infections they got in hospitals. The least expensive response to it is the most effective. That is to make sure that at five critical junctures in someone's hospital stay, that everybody who will be touching them practices basic sterilization programs. And the most effective way of doing it is to make that the only thing in a hospital where a nurse who operates like a master sergeant in the military can order the doctors around and enforce this. And, and there are tests that have been done on this all over the world, and they all show whether it's in, Arca, uh, I mean in America or in some remote village in Africa or Southeast Asia, they all get the same results. You reduce infection, you reduce readmissions, you save a ton of money. Another example, in eastern Pennsylvania, there's a healthcare network called the Geisinger Network with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of doctors that if you enroll in that, first of all, you pay a fee for performance, not procedure. Secondly, if for any reason, within 90 days of leaving the hospital after they work with you on any procedure, you have to be readmitted, they bear the whole cost and cannot raise your premium, your co-pays, or your deductible if you go back. Even if it's not their fault, for 90 days they make that deal. Guess what? The medical error rate for the doctors and the guys here network has dropped to virtually zero. Every single doctor of whatever age has this massive book that is updated, I think, on a weekly basis of the best practices on a zillion things. And they say, we believe medicine is an art, but it's first a science. It's like being a pilot. You still go through the checklist every time, and then if you get up in a horrible storm, you can't see where you're doing, you get in an air pocket, and you know if you fly too fast, the, winds will, the wings will bust off, and you fly too slow, you will sink like a stone and can't come out of it. That's art. But first, do the science. That's the way they're practicing medicine, and they've had a big drop in, the, in medical error rates and a big drop in costs, and they've passed a lot of the benefits on to their people. A lot of employers, as you know, reward their employees for staying healthier. They ought to get a significant tax incentive to do that. And then you asked finally, what about small businesses? I think we got to figure out what we have to do to get the lending going again. And I think we have to figure out what we have to do if their relative cost, that is as a percentage of overall operations, of participating in the health experiments of participating in the energy efficiency movement. If they're higher than your relative cost, then I think that we ought to have a tax structure which recognizes that. And I think we may, we may have to de-link the sub-S corporations that are actual ongoing businesses, non, like, like they're non-financial ongoing businesses, from the individual income tax rate to give them a chance to keep going. You know, basically, if you're not a corporation, you don't pay dual taxes. That is, you don't. But the ongoing enterprise that was set up for small family businesses who kept all their own money just pay whatever the individual income tax is, but they pay at one time. They don't pay corporate tax, and then they don't draw an income and pay income tax. Now it's been made to look like a burden on small businesses as if it was just like the corporate tax. It's not true for like 
hedge funds that set up the under the sub S corporations. But it is true for dry cleaners or car repair shops or other things. So that needs to be reexamined. And the final thing I think we ought to do is accelerate this uh, process that they have underway in Washington, but I really worked hard on it when I was president. This whole reinventing government initiative, we got rid of 16,000 pages of regulation. We drastically shortened the time when you got a yes or a no on any application. Al Gore just killed himself on that for eight years. And the Social Security Administration got Inc. Magazine's award when I was president for being the most consumer responsive operation in the country because we set up 24-hour call lines. We did all the stuff in, you know, late 20th century technology to do it. The, the, the compliance cost relative to revenues of a lot of these regulations are just too high for a lot of small businesses. So we need to sequence the implementation of all these new rules effectively and cut the compliance costs by getting rid of some things that don't need to be done if we put on something new that does. I think we did all that. You guys would produce, you, the American private sector, would produce more than 12 million jobs in the next four years because we got a lot of pent-up demand. Well, great. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, uh, President Clinton for his uh, tremendous insights uh, and joining us here on the Dell World stage. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all you, the great insights you've offered and, and uh, your service to our country and our world. Thank you. Thank you.